Hi there. Um, so the description from the thumbnail, um, Worse Than Death, is a description that Jordan Peterson gave about benzodiazepine withdrawal. And I'm going to put the link to that video in the description. And he was basically um, started on benzodiazepines for a brief period, but stayed on them longer and ended up developing tolerance and in a very short time. And then the process of coming off of those drugs were was pretty harrowing experience. And you can follow the story there. But what we're going to talk about today is about a class of psychiatric drugs called benzodiazepines. And if you're not familiar with them, these drugs are widely used. I'm going to read a passage from uh, the deep prescribing guideline by Mark Horowitz and David Taylor. Um, benzodiazepine and Z drugs are widely used throughout the world for conditions such as anxiety, insomnia, epilepsy, alcohol withdrawal, and also they're used as a pre-medication um, before procedures like dental procedures, for example. They're also used in a wide variety of off-label cases such as rest leg, restless leg syndrome, tinnitus, dementia, and mania. Um, when I worked in acute care in an emergency, usually when you have somebody coming in like floridly manic or psychotic, that is one of the drugs that's used for patients who are highly agitated or in a really altered state of consciousness. Um, so their benefits in acute syndrome are clear. There is some evidence that efficacy persists when used for a number of weeks. Nonetheless, the danger of long-term prescribing are widely accepted. Long-term use is associated with a number of physical and cognitive risks, including loss of e efficacy, so they stop working. Um, if they were prescribed for anxiety, depression, or I mean, um, insomnia, it, they will help in the short term, but long term, they they don't work for people, they stop working. But that's not only that, um, there's a risk of physical dependence, tolerance, memory disturbance for older people, falls and fractures, potentially dementia, and likely increased mortality. So the FDA in the US has recently re-emphasized the risk of abuse, misuse, addiction, physical dependence, and withdrawal with benzodiazepine requiring a boxed warning. This is previously called the black, spot, the black box warning, which is the most prominent warning for this drug class. So most clinical guidelines recommend that benzodiazepines and Z drugs should be used only for in crisis situations and not for longer than two to four weeks. Um, one of the healthcare providers in the U.S., Kaiser Permanente, advises that all patients should be encouraged to discontinue chronic use of benzodiazepines and Z drugs as there's no evidence to support the long-term use longer than two weeks. So of you know these drugs for insomnia or any other mental health indication for anything. Um, now, long-term use remains common in the UK with 300,000 adults taking either a benzodiazepine for more than 12 months. In the US, in 2019, an estimated 92 million prescriptions for benzodiazepine were dispensed <clears throat> from US outpatient pharmacies with alp alprazolam, which is Xanax, being the most common, followed by clonazepam, then lorazepam. In total, 30.6 million adults in the US, one in eight adults used benzodiazepine in 2015 and 2016. In 2018, an estimated 50% of patients who were dispensed oral benzodiazepines received them for a duration of two months or longer. So, the issues that people are going to experience on these the uh, medic drugs, um, the adverse effects, for example, cognitive, there's deficits of memory, attention, increased reaction time, motor, motor and coordination, drowsiness, nightmares, intrusive thoughts, impaired judgment, 
reduced social functioning due to effects of memory, inability to remember new people, appointments, etc., perceptual illusions and hallucinations. And these are, by the way, easily mistaken for psychiatric disorders. Um, physical, motor and coordination, dizziness, slurred speech, sensory alterations, rash, um, autom autonomic dysfunction, such as uh, tachycardia, diaphoresis, hy hypotension, hypertension, increased morbidity, increased risk of motor vehicle accident, um, higher risk of falls, delirium, all of these. So these are the drug, the class of drugs that we're going to be talking about today. So if you're new here, uh, uh, welcome and please uh, hit the subscribe button and join us so you don't miss any future episodes. And we would love to hear from you, your questions and comments on this topic. My name is Nesret. I am um, a mental health coach uh, with 17 years of psychiatric um, nursing experience. I've worked with the adult population as well as uh, pediatric population throughout my career. And I have seen these drugs uh, prescribed to patients on both population. And I've also seen the effect that these drugs have as well as when people are cut off uh, from their prescriber or going through um, in the process of tapering and the horrific withdrawals that they experience. And this is my partner, um, Ben, and uh, he is a coach and he also has uh, interest in these areas. And we just usually just have conversations um, about these topics. So um, I got a, a quote, a, a comment from one of the viewers on the YouTube channel about in this topic. And I'm just going to quickly um, read that comment because I thought it was very helpful and also really a challenging situation for this person. But this is the type of thing that happens to people with them being prescribed a lot of these drugs for a very long time. Um, give me one second. This type of story is not... uncommon. So this person says, I was on clonazepam for 30 years, did not get informed consent. I had no idea that clonazepam was changing my brain chemistry. And clonazepam is one of the benzodiazepine drugs. My doctor retired and no one would prescribe clonazepam. I was so sick, I had no idea what was going on to me, what was happening to me when clonazepam is forcibly stopped in and out of hospitals six times. I know that every single doctor that I've seen knows what's happening to me, but won't document it because I would have a malpractice case. The doctors protect each other. They wouldn't do this to themselves. I can't believe what they've done to me. I can't. People with mental illness are labeled. And once you have the label, you cease to be a human being. So it's not uncommon for people to be on these drugs for months and years, and then they're usually abruptly stopped sometimes, and people won't get prescription. They, they're they sometimes labeled as addicts and medication-seeking. The acute withdrawal is recognized, but it's not treated appropriately. They're not safely tapered to come off, off of these drugs. And um, the long-term uh, what's called the protracted withdrawal, the complications and the withdrawal that continue even after you stop the medication for a very long time, sometimes for months, sometimes for years, they're not recognized in the system and people have to struggle with those things for a long time and some of them permanently. Well, and what's not listed in the uh, black box warning uh, which I just recently learned, one of the things that can actually happen almost as a co uh, comorbidity with benzodiazepine is actually alcohol abuse. 
So say in the case that your prescriber cuts off your prescription yeah. and you're going to withdraw. The, one of the substances you can get your hands on that behaves very similar to a benzodiazepine is alcohol. Like, mm -hmm. So there's actually a high risk of alcohol abuse with the taking of benzodiazepines if not properly tapered. Well, the, the thing about that too, um, another issue with uh, alcohol or opioids and benzodiazepines is um, there's a risk of uh, respiratory sedation when you combine alcohol and benzodiazepines or opioids, which there's a risk of like abuse of all those things. But those combining that with alcohol actually lowers your respiration where a lot of people um, overdose on those drugs. Yeah. Combining them with alcohol. Yeah. And I don't even know if we kind of get caught up in our own jargon, but I don't even know if abuse is the right term in these instances, right? It's because every, every form of addiction, and I was more in the camp previously of splitting hairs between dependency and addiction. And mostly because addiction has that negative connotation and that stigma attached to it. As if someone who is in any type of addiction, you know, is weak of character and is abusing something. And this is all, you know, self-driven and negative where really they're just, they're just seeking relief. So there is a, a definitely what, what we're talking about here is people who were prescribed these drugs and they were taking them as prescribed and develop dependency. So there is a little bit of a, a line, which is that people are not going out and see, some people end up doing that eventually because they realize like they need more of the drug and the prescriber won't prescribe additional drugs. But for most people, they were prescribed these drugs by their family physician or psychiatrist, and they stayed on them and take them as prescribed. They're not trying to abuse it or misuse it or get it off the street or any of that. These are people who are actually taking their drugs as prescribed and then develop tolerance and dependency. And then when they come off of it, go into withdrawal. So we're not talking about necessarily people who have actually an addictions background and history. So there's a there's definitely a line and a difference, but at the same time, in terms of the outcomes of what people end up experiencing is the same thing to some extent. And I've heard different clinicians describe that in their practice where they prescribe medication, a history mm -hmm. of addiction to other substances is no indication to development of addiction or dependency on psychiatric drugs. So they could have a, a patient who has never had, never smoked a cigarette, chewed tobacco, done drugs, no history of substance addiction or abuse until they get on psychiatric medication and specifically benzodiazepines. It's like, so there is also no indication of history where typically we would think, you know, if someone was addicted to one substance, mm it's more likely that they would be addicted to something else. But if they've been exposed to something that we would say is addictive and not become addictive, you know, vis-a-vis -vis alcohol or cigarettes, mm. that they wouldn't have a risk. It's like, but that doesn't seem to be true when it comes to benzodiazepines. No, no. And that is, that is a lot of unsuspecting people who are just, you know, um, having a crisis or, you know, let's say a major breakup, or they might have a lot of stressful events around them or work stress or relationship stress. And they go to the family physician, you know, I'm not sleeping. I am anxious all the time, blah, blah, blah. Oh, here's some medication and use it, you know, usually 30 days. And even somebody who's using it for a week or two can develop that de dependency and they don't realize that. And I've also come across people who family members who have had a prescription for a long time saying, here, you know, take a handful. I mean, that's a lay person who doesn't know anything about those medications. Obviously, they weren't educated by the physicians either to the danger of the medications that they would give that to a person. But you could be on these drugs for a very brief period and develop that tolerance. Absolutely. Yeah, people can get exposed essentially. And it's the same thing with other psychiatric drugs, even though we're not going to go there today, um, like antidepressants that people become dependent on. 
Well, it's strange because it seems like all of these uh, psychiatric drugs actually have a paradoxical effect on the brain. It's like, so a benzodiazepine is an anti-anxiety medication. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a sedative. Yeah. It's like, so whether you're taking a sedative or a stimulant, your brain adjusts its neurotransmitters in the opposite direction of what you're trying to accomplish. It's like, so if you're trying to slow your brain down, your brain naturally tries to go back into homeostasis and actually speeds up the production of that neurotransmitter, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, benzodiazepines, they're gabapentinoids, correct? No. Because I, I thought not. the neurotransmitter they work on is GABA. I could be wrong. This is way, way outside of my my understanding. Yeah, that's a, a separate uh, class of drugs. Um, but in terms of benzodiazepines, um, they do affect all the different neurotransmitters and GABA being one of them. Absolutely. Yeah. But the gabapentinoids are a separate class of drugs. Yeah, but they seem to have that. And this is just, this is known mm -hmm. that there is this paradoxical effect with psychiatric drugs. And one of the most reported side effects of taking a benzodiazepine is increased anxiety. It's like, see, so yeah, so that's you put what on I meant. A, an anti anxiety yeah. medication that ultimately will make you much more anxious. Yeah, it loses its efficacy after a period of time. And um, that is what you find is that paradoxical effect, which is the opposite of what it's me meant to do. And um, the same thing with insomnia. And a lot of the times then people also from there experience akathisia, they experience all kinds of other effects, perceptual disturbances, tinnitus, sensitivity to light, sound. Um, so there's a host of things that come with it. But yes, they actually in the long term end up having the opposite effect of what they were intended to do or that they don't even they're not effective for what they were intended to do either. Yeah. And I know we kind of, we go over this sequence of events pretty much every time we have these conversations, but it mm -hmm. has been as just a, like a, a lay person, it's been the most shocking thing that I've kind of learned since we've been doing this work is the harm that these medications cause, whether that's side effects or withdrawal symptoms are mm. not recognized as atrogenic harm. Your doctor will not tell you that it's because of the medication. It's like the chances yeah. of that are almost 0%. And that is that is a, a, a almost pure zealotry inside of psychiatry. Yeah. So one, one of the other major risks of always taking any class of these drugs, whether it's a benzodiazepine or not, is that if you start to experience these symptoms, you run the risk of running into polypharmacy and subsequent diagnosis when you go back to your doctor and report how you are actually feeling and trying to get off of the medication. It's like, so you'll go there, you know, you'll say, well, my anxiety is way worse or, you know, I'm, I can't control my movements with Zacathesia or whatever you report. Mm -hmm. And a normal person who read the warning label would be like, oh, these medications can actually cause these side effects. You know, maybe we should taper you off this, try something different, you're not responding to it well. Chances are you'll actually be told that you're just more ill than originally thought. And you'll get another yeah. medication put on top of it, and another medication put on top of it. It is it is a huge that in and of itself, that risk for polypharmacy, I think, is actually one of the biggest risks to getting a prescription in the first place. Absolutely. Um I'm going to uh, read a quick note from the Benzodiazepine uh, Coalition, Information Coalition, which uh, speaks to some of this. Um, they This is one of their uh, page, uh, about page, and it says, those suffering from a benzodiazepine-induced disability lack adequate support as they struggle to understand the cause of their suffering and find treatment. They're told the problem doesn't exist, that it is all in their head, and they're given irrelevant tests resulting in misdiagnosis, which what you're describing is those psychiatric symptoms of withdrawal symptoms are misdiagnosed as psychiatric disorders. Even when the cause of the injury is discovered, medical professionals often employ a classic addiction model that's inappropriate and often disabling. 
for more common problems of benzodiazepine dependence resulting from prescribed usage under medical supervision, patients should not be forced to undergo the most deadly drug withdrawal known to science based on information gathered from the internet. Since accurate information is not provided by most prescribers, websites devoid of benzodiazepine withdrawal often perform a life-saving function. So because some patients have little no, to no help, uh, little to no trouble taking benzodiazepine or coming off of them, the medical community assumes that this experience should be the norm. So essentially what people are told when they've been on benzodiazepines, whether it's like a month or two months or even 10 or 15 years is to taper very fast, like take, you know, half your dose for two you know, two weeks and then quarter your dose. I have spoken with patients who went into become so destabilized and hospitalized for seizures from benzodiazepine withdrawal, which is one of the more fatal uh, adverse reactions, like withdrawal symptoms that you can have. Um, and yeah, many of the symptoms that I read are usually misdiagnosed for um a psychiatric disorder, an onset of a new illness. And most of the time, yes, the solution is going to be, let's add an antipsychotic, let's add a mood stabilizer, let's add an antidepressant or a sleep drug, which are called the Z drugs, for example, which are very um, powerful also and have addictive qualities. So it's actually, so the system doesn't recognize the acute, they, they recognize a little bit of the acute withdrawal, but they don't treat it appropriately and effectively. And with very, you have to go very slow in the tapering process. And that's not done. I've seen patients discharged from hospitals while they're still in acute withdrawal and also protracted withdrawal. And this is adults and kids alike. Yeah, so well, yeah, it's... there's a huge chance the person is going to end up on a whole bunch more medications and with a new diagnosis. Yeah, well, e even if we, you know, even if we break apart the populations, because it's one of the tricky things, uh, you know, with psych drugs and with benzodiazepines is there is a there is a certain portion of the population that gets prescribed a benzodiazepine and takes it as prescribed that can come off it very quickly. They hop off it and they're fine. No, yeah, no big deal. And they can hop back on and they can take it as a PRN two, three, four, 10 times a year as needed. And, and, and they're fine. It's like, and, and that's great. You know, our, our perspective is always to be orientated towards a person's quality of life. It's like, so if you're one of those people, that's fantastic. The problem is if you fall into the other population that ends up with akathisia or seizures or the entire gambit of different side effects and withdrawal symptoms, the fact that they are not treated with respect, they are not, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? They, they are essentially dismissed or, oh, yeah. or institutionalized. And I mean that in the most pure sense of the word, they will just tell you that you are crazy. Yeah, many people will end up having all kinds of investigations like GI and all kinds of, you know, medical investigations that turned out to be not, you know, they can't find anything. And so they're, you know, dubbed as somatic or a drug seeking. That's another one that they're just looking for additional prescriptions or higher doses. And so people and or like I said, misdiagnosed either way, um, this is not something a lot of the times people have feel like they are having to struggle with this on their own. Their prescribers don't understand, their psychiatrists don't understand, medical professionals don't understand. So you're pretty much on your own. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a real, like a true, true sense of, of loneliness, you know, because it, it, it's very different to be alone and opposed to an institution like psychiatry. You know, that that disproportionate amount of authority that 
you know, these institutions have, I think, you know, psychologically can create a real sense of loneliness and despair when people aren't listened to by that institution. You know, not only just not listened to, because it's one thing for them to just say nothing, mm. but it's another thing for them to just so aggressively try to assure you that you're wrong and that you're wrong about your health. And not only is it your health, it's your mental health. It's like it, it attacks a person's subjectivity and capacity to really trust their own sense of self and their own sense of the world and their life and what they need and what's going on with them. Like it, it potentially is one of the most isolating things that I can imagine. Oh, yes. I mean, when this happens to people, when they go into benzodiazepine withdrawal, even someone high functioning and incredibly smart and brilliant like Jordan Peterson, it compromised his work. It compromised his relationships. A lot of people end up going on disability. They can't work. The physical, it becomes like it's a debilitating physically but also emotionally, mentally, work-wise, your ability to function at home, it is pervasive. And so when you're in that place and you got in there because you were following your prescriber's guidelines to take these medications and how long you're supposed to be staying on them, you weren't informed about that. Why would anybody leave someone on a benzo for 30 years? or even? a year when it is the guidelines are told you to prescribe for no more than two to four weeks. And then you should encourage your patients to taper appropriately and slowly. And so now the person is in this situation and it is, and then it's, it's, you go back to the clinician, they either offer you more meds or different meds, or they don't acknowledge the problem at all or well, take that's... it in all seriousness. Yeah. It's inc incredibly isolating and it's dehumanizing. Yeah, and that's the problem with, you know, the medical model, right, which psychiatry really transitioned to uh, more, more in the 1980s is really when that medical model really started to be the shift for psychiatry, that these were brain disorders, they were physical, biological diseases. It's like, so for, you know, a trained doctor who goes through everything and it's, you know, the one of the best marketing slogans ever. You know, psychiatric medications are for your depression, like insulin is for your diabetes. It's like, and that was, that's a, an actual slogan through this, the psychiatric industry. You will hear it in Sweden. You will hear it in California. You will hear it in Saskatchewan. It is not an accident that verbatim you will hear this. It's like insulin for diabetes. Because that's oh, yeah. how someone ends up on a, on a medication for 30 years. It's like, because it's a disease. That's how we treat it. It's it's an intractable brain disorder. And this is the treatment for it. Why would I ever take this patient off their medication? It's like, so fundamentally, that that's where the problem really is. Yeah, and the, the names of the, dr the drugs are actually pretty misleading because that, you know, anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic, antidepressant, people assume and believe that th those are the drugs are what they do and they correct that, you know, quote unquote, chemical imbalance. But in the long term use, it actually happens to be that these drugs are under the umbrella of a psychoactive agent, just like any other um, psych drug and also illicit drugs. And they create all kinds of problems for people. Um, and when you think about on a, in the broader sense about mental health in general, People develop mental health issues most of the time because they've experienced trauma, there's social pressures, financial pressures, poverty, uh, abuse, um, you know, illiteracy, lack of education. Like there's so many different factors, not to mention, you know, diet and uh, exercise and social connections and all those things. It's not as simple as you have a chemical imbalance, but yes, that is what has been, what's that's the dominant narrative in psychiatry and that people have bought. But now when you look at the state of affairs in the world in terms of mental health, 
we've had these drugs now for 50, 60 years, and we still have a fully blown public health crisis when it comes to mental health. Yeah, outcomes have actually gotten worse in the last 50 years. It's like yeah. they haven't gotten better. The burden of uh, psychiatric issues, you know, across, you know, basically society uh, have gotten worse. The burden's gotten greater. Yeah. And you would think if we had all of these miracle drugs and every, you know, every Tuesday, like clockwork, there's a new one, you know, you get a new miracle drug that they'll prescribe for 15 different disorders, which still makes no sense to me. Now I am, I am no doctor. It's like, but why do you prescribe an antipsychotic for nine different things? So these one, yeah, these wonder drugs, you would think that over that period of time, we would have the stats showing that the burden of psychiatric disorder has gone down and not up, yeah. which all indications that it's increased quite substantially. Yeah. So I find that is the, one of the things I find with benzodiazepines is that it is prescribed for so many people inappropriately in situations that should not be prescribed at all from the beginning, for one. Like minor things of somebody, you know, having sleep issues because they just, let's say, have moved into a new city. They're living there for the first time as a young person attending university, they maybe have had just their first major breakup, and then they go to emergency or they go to a psychiatrist and they are offered those things. Um, or just things that, and then when they are prescribed, they the person is not informed usually of what is the potential risk here with long-term use and properly explained these situations and also how difficult and harrowing a journey is going to be to come off of benzodiazepines. A lot of people go into severe withdrawal with these and will take their lives because the withdrawal is so incredible. Like people don't even know how to describe the suffering and the pain that comes with withdrawing from benzodiazepines. It is just hellish. It is incredibly torturous and there is no they're not guided through a safe tapering even in the process of safe tapering it will still be for some people a terrible process to go through and and it doesn't mean that people can't recover from benzo withdrawal there's lots of examples of people who go through that process but they still have like lingering symptoms over the years and it's a very slow process and you have to go incredibly slowly and tapering. I mean, just m tiny um, micro tapers. Yeah. So the whole process from like beginning to end, the amount of prescriptions, like 92 million prescriptions in the U.S. alone. That's like mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. And the and that in, that idea of in, informed consent is really so important because that's that's one of the major issues inside of psychiatry itself. Is the truth is when you take a, ben a benzo or any other psychoactive substance, you have no idea what it's going to do to you. Not not the doctors, the researchers, not the pharmaceutical companies, nobody. They have no idea what it's going to do. They have theories and a hypothesis. It's like, but how you as an individual is going to respond to it, you don't know until you take it. It's like, it, it's a huge risk. It's a huge risk. And there's a, a myriad of reasons, depending on where you live, why they have, you know, techniques for compliance. You know, and one of them is just not telling you what the side effects are or what people actually go through when they have an adverse reaction or withdrawal from these medications. It's like part of this is understood and done purposefully by prescribers uh, for compliance. Well, I've been in many, many meetings with psychiatrists and where there was, you know, a diagnosis being given, an assessment being done, and a prescription handed out. And I will tell you that most of the time what prescribers cover as an informed consent is mild potential um, 
effect. Very rarely they will they will mention other serious, more serious effects, but very briefly, like these discussions are maybe three to five minutes at most. The the more serious effects and potential risks as far as like dependency, suicidal ideation, um, permanent damages, they're very briefly mentioned if that if not they're not mentioned at all so people actually really uh they're told you know you might have a little bit of these these drugs are safe and well to tolerated by most people which is true some people um for some portion of the population mm -hmm. psychiatric drugs or even benzos might have some beneficial effects but then they are able to come off of them safely but that's not the case for everyone. But informed consent is the discussion should be an ongoing discussion and also monitoring so that a person knows what is what are the worst things that could happen on this drug. I mean, that's what they tell you when you're going into surgery. They're going to be very frank and upfront. Like there's this much you know, risk of doing well. They, you could die from this or it could make things worse. Like they're very explicit in how they, people are usually told in other areas of medicine of the risk that they're taking. But in a psychiatry, that's not the case. Yeah, and it's that uh, almost parental quality of, of psychiatry. It's like, it that that happens strictly because it's your mental health and not your, your physical health. So it's very easy for them or for anybody to go, oh, well, this, this person's sick, especially under the you know disease model. It's like, it's so dehumanizing. You no longer are a functioning human. You know, you're, you are now automatically less than the people around you because they've handed out this diagnosis. Now you can't think clearly, oh, you can't make decisions for yourself or your, your subjectivity is so skewed that you need other people to really inform you about what's best for you and whether you should take this medication or what type of treatment path you should go down. It's dehumanizing, it's belittling. And even in the best of cases, there is that paternal quality to psychiatry where they're the adults, they know what's right. They know what's best for you. Shut up and do what you're told. It's like, and, and and I and I I choose those words carefully because their attitude is a shut up and do what you're told. That's not high, that's not hyperbolic in my opinion. That is how they think. I have heard that from many, many patients over the years. Like that paternalistic attitude, I know what's best for you. Uh, you and then once you have the label, like this lady was this person was describing in that email then you can treat, they can treat you however the way they want. And then of course there is like, we can talk about this another time, but the involuntary treatment, which doesn't happen in any other area of medicine, but in psychiatry. And it's not to say I am completely against that, but that's a separate issue. In some situations it could be effective, but that attitude though is very pervasive in psychiatry. I am better than you. Um, you, your mental capacity is compromised. So now you have this diagnosis and then there is all the treatment and issue that comes with it. And also patients are dismissed a lot of the times because when they complain about the clinician, like a psychiatrist, because that complaint is coming from someone who has a mental disorder. So their capacity to think clearly or their insight and their judgment is compromised. So we're not going to listen to them. So definitely that power imbalance between clinician and patient is huge in psychiatry. Yeah, and one of, uh, one of the most interesting kind of explanations for the, the argument for the efficacy of psychiatric drugs that I've heard recently is mm -hmm. psychiatric drugs have the capacity to make the people around the person suffering more comfortable. Yeah. 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 And I, and including I the clinicians, by the way. Oh, oh yeah. No, it's everybody. It's Everyone. Everybody. Yeah. It's everybody. Family, friends, yeah. clinicians, mental health professionals. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I don't know. That because what you're doing is containing that person 
and in a way chemically restraining them so that they're more sedated, they're not agitated, they're not out of control, and you just bring it down. Yeah. Yeah. And that 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 little phrase there is enough to chew on for a while. Like really, really think about the, the kind of the truth that's in that statement and uh and its implications. It's it's one of the more uh almost shocking things that I've heard in a while where it was just very true. You're just like, you know what? I, I've had that experience myself, you know, before I knew a little bit more about kind of psychiatry and how it works and what people go through and different types of therapies. It does just make you feel better. You know, like I have, I have family members that have been diagnosed with severe mental illness. It's like, and from their interactions with their doctors to being medicated to their diagnosis, mm. it, it is done more to keep us comfortable than to do anything to actually treat the patient. You know, their, their, their life, you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. You know, if you were to dream up a way to torture someone for 50 years, that's an excellent way to do it. Yeah, because what these drugs do is um, they sedate a person, they blunt their emotions, they curb that agitation of an irritation, and then they're also people are cut off from their emotions. Their cognitive uh, ability is compromised. So that's what I usually call that psychological, a version of a psychological life support, I know, or sometimes people call it, you know, feeling chemically lobotomized yeah. and that's essentially you know the person is subdued and toned down and not making any problems for people I mean they did that like I said with lobotomy that's what they found out when they basically scrambled your brain that the person was less aggressive and less this or that and it was toned down and it's it's unfortunate and I mean it's terrible this yeah, is the very, way that we tragic. treat psychiatric disorders. Yeah, but it's... also normal human suffering. You know, our ability, people don't come to us when they're really desperate and alone. And it shows that we can have the ability to sit with them in their loneliness or distress and find other creative ways to help them cope and move forward in their lives. You know, that's compassionate and empathic and supportive this is a more you know this drive through medical and psychiatric care where people are given a prescription and then just told to go and live their lives of like quiet desperation essentially it's not it's not a life no it's not a life and some and some instances you know when you break it down into simple terms the fact that these things have happened at all let alone in enormous numbers for the last 50 or 60 years. It's just absurd. You know, Bill walks into his psychiatrist's office. Bill, what's going on? Why did you want to see me today? It's like, well, this week, you know, my house burned down. I lost my job. My wife left me and my dog got run over, you know, and I'm feeling pretty depressed. And the doctor turns to Bill. Oh, well, that's simple, Bill. You have a chemical imbalance in your brain. It's like, what? It's like, or, yeah. or the obvious circumstances of a tragic and difficult life have created a normal human response not to be treated by medication. It's like, and how it just became so easy and convenient. Just like, oh, chemical balance in your brain. Like, oh, can you show me a, a test, a scan? a measurement, any way to show me that oh, the serotonin levels in my brain are too low. Can you show me that? And the answer is unequivocally no. no. No, never, not once, not for anybody. It's never happened. Not a thing. It's actually a hypothesis of what psychiatric drugs did to people's brains. So the counter response would be the problem. Oh, if this, you know, if you have schizophrenia, it's a dopaminergic 
disorder. It's like, so if this drug manipulates the dopamine, then that must be true. And it's just a reverse engineered hypothesis. It's like a no different for benzodiazepines. And to get back on benzodiazepines, because it's been slightly tangential here. Uh, the other thing I learned is that benzodiazepines are actually, uh, they interfere with adjunct therapy. It's like, so certain clinicians in their own practices report that people who are on benzodiazepines don't respond to other treatments because they're so sedated. It's like, yeah. because of the sedation, like the cognitive ability isn't there to go through CBT or psychoanalysis or any type of more traditional therapy where their patients who are not on benzodiazepines, same, you know, it's an anxiety disorder. It's like, so this is the same kind of population, same cohort mm. of people mm. ones on benzodiazepines don't do well. You know, they have a remission for that two, three, four weeks, and then they get worse. And not only do they get worse, they can't be treated with adjunct therapy because the drugs have them so dulled. Yes, their cognitive, uh, there's a huge cognitive decline that comes with yeah. benzos, memory issues. Uh, people will have a tough time even just remembering normal things. Um, then the anxiety gets worse, their sleep is not good. So it really compromises them and not be able to really participate, whether it's in groups or therapy or any of that. And also, like I said, functioning at work and at a school and it it's incredibly debilitating. A lot of people end up on disability because of benzodiazepine use and withdrawal. Yeah, and it's just like, I don't know, it's just wild to think about even as a trajectory for treatment. Mm. You know, someone has complaint of heightened anxiety. It's like, and your anxiety has to be pretty high to go see a doctor. It's like, and that's not somatic. That's not just in your head. Like that's a real symptom for whatever reason somebody is experiencing. It's like, and without talking to the person, you know, taken by case, case, case by case basis, who knows why their anxiety is spiking at that time in their life, but it is. It's like, and then you go in and you take your treatment. Oh, this is an anti-anxiety drug. Take this. You'll be fine. Turns out it doesn't work. And you can get caught up in medications for, you know, as few as two weeks and as long as 60 years. It's like, so even if it takes you 10 years to figure out that, oh, I actually responded very poorly to these medications, they made my anxiety worse. And I had these side effects where I got more medications. I did that for a few years, finally got so frustrated and so sick that I tried to cold turkey off my medications, which caused another whole set of problems until I finally found someone who could actually taper me off properly because I had to go back on them because I was so sick from going cold turkey off those medications on and on and on and on. And then even after a gradual taper, we don't know why this started in the first place. It's like, so a lot of times people actually come out of these tapers and off of these drugs with their original problem, you know, whatever that was. Oh no, not only with the original problem, but now but they're more, worse. More, they're worse, a lot worse in terms worse. of, in the process of the treatment. And they will, it, it's like they will never be the same most of the time. Even like you said, after, first of all, you get in that hamster wheel of in and out of hospitals, more drugs, more diagnoses, then the horrific withdrawals. And even if you go through the proper tapering, by the way, and good luck finding anybody that knows anything about proper tapering. Yeah, there's about four people. Yeah, there's yeah. practically nobody who knows how to taper people properly. And so then, and then you end up, even after you discontinue the medication and even after you discontinue uh, taper properly, you still have certain problems that you're going to be dealing with. Sometimes nobody knows for how long. So yeah. it's just, it's a terrible thing. Th the issue is reckless prescribing and reckless prescribers that don't educate people properly about the, the risks that are associated and then keep people for months and years and decades on these drugs. So if you're a prescriber, it's just a terrible, this is a terrible thing to do to a person. 
there's no reason for you to pres keep prescribing these drugs and not help someone to taper safely and to keep them for, for that long. So it's not, I don't blame the person that is going through this. I blame the prescribers. Yeah, and I, it, it's been my opinion since we kind of started looking into these things. If someone is a prescriber, and I think this should almost be written into law, not really, but you know, in the weird areas of my brain. If you are someone who prescribes psychoactive drugs. Yeah, family you, doctors can prescribe uh, yeah. benzodiazepines and so psychiatrists. And you think that they're perfectly safe and there's really no side effects and you can just come off them in a couple of weeks, you know, 50% taper and then off. Go for it. Go for it. It's just like a Tic Tac perfectly safe take your own take your own treatment and none of them would none of them oh yeah no 80 percent of prescribers would never take their wouldn't, own recommendation and would, would, would never get on it. any of these drugs yeah no nope, couldn't pay them to take it yeah that yep, tells you about everything you need to know oh yeah benzos are i think one of the worst class of drugs uh, in long-term use, not to say that I'm for any of the psychiatric drugs. Um, in acute crisis, I believe these can be effective and helpful. Uh, but long-term, probably besides the neuroleptics, these are the worst type of drugs to be on. Yeah. And in a certain dosage, like you combine these with alcohol, it's a recipe for disaster or opiates. Um, and or if you give someone a lethal dose of benzodiazepines, it is, yeah, it's a serious uh, risk for overdose. Um, and definitely somebody, like you said earlier in the beginning, actually developing an addiction and on these drugs. Yeah, and I guess my whole point is not to be, you know, doom and gloom or anti anything. Mm. It's more for purposes of education. We're having the other half of the conversation that your doctor won't talk to you about. You know, it, it it's to advocate for like truly informed consent for treatment. Mm -hmm. It's like, and that's, that's the main thrust of my, my thinking around this topic. I'm not anti-medication or anti-psychiatrist or really anti-anything. I'm, I am pro people getting the treatment that is going to make them have the best quality of life possible. And for each yeah. person, that's going to be a slightly different story every time. Yeah. Well, the other piece is there's the people who have been um, at this, in this moment, there are people who are taking benzodiazepines and have been taking them for a while and they are developing withdrawal tolerance and going through that process mm -hmm. and they're not finding the support that they need to actually come off of these um, drugs safely and then in that process so what do you do what do you say to that person I think that's the first the most important thing is to educate yourself and there is lots of online support as well as people who actually uh, talk about it. The Deprescribing Guidelines, this is by Mark Horowitz, is a fantastic book. I'll put the um, uh, the link in the description. And um, another person that talks about this is Dr. Yosef Wittoring. So, and I usually have the his uh, website link on the description as well. And uh, he runs a tapering clinic and a uh, fantastic service that way. And he also has a ton of information on his YouTube channel about safe tapering um, off benzodiazepines as well as any other psychiatric drugs. So I think it's really important if you're in that situation and you've been taking benzodiazepines for a while and you haven't been educated by the prescriber to all the risk and now you're starting to experience problems that you educate yourself about safe tapering. Because your prescriber, your physician or psychiatrist most likely has zero clues around that, which is sad because now you're having to educate or 
interface with someone who has who can either cut you off or tell you to taper inappropriately, which is going to destabilize you and create problems for you. So you're in a very um, challenging situations, but that doesn't mean that there's no help and support out there. There's a lot of informal, um, you know, forums and online groups, but you also want to see if you can find someone, a coach who has gone through their own personal journey of uh, tapering or try to get an actual professional help as well. There's very few people out there doing this type of work, but there are people out there that could help you. It's not a hopeless situation. Um, do you have any anything else that you wanted to discuss or? Uh, I don't think so. I think I kind of got in the things that have been most interesting to me looking into kind of benzodiazepines and I really wanted to make sure to cover the fact that uh, that they do really interfere with adjunct therapy. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's really important to know that uh, specifically because a lot of people with anxiety disorders respond really well to analysis and behavioral treatment. It's like, so talk therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy are especially CBT are really, really useful for people who have different types of anxiety disorders. The efficacy there is like hundred percent. Almost everybody has some type of positive response to them and there's no real downside. It's not like medication. If it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. It's like, and you move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to know that if you are on a benzodiazepine and you're trying to seek different types of treatment other than medications, the medication itself can actively interfere with the efficacy of other treatments. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a big one. And uh, the other pieces, there's also some research coming out um, that can help in terms of uh, metabolic therapies and ketogenic diet that can help in the process of, as you're coming off of any psychiatric drugs, but especially benzodiazepine, um, I mean, the keto diet has a lot of implication for kind of normalizing brain chemistry. And there's it's an in, infancy for treatment of psychiatric disorders. But there's been some studies that they've done around addiction recovery that it does help. So I think it's important to implement the basics of like cognitive um, sort of for sleep, like CBTI. But again, you could be in a place where you're compromised your capacity to understand and kind of implement these things. But I would still attempt to go back to the basics of self-care and reducing stress and getting proper sleep and getting a proper diet so that you're in a more of resilient place to cope with what you're going to go through with the withdrawals, with the tapering process as well. Um, and I think it would also help to have like some coaching and support um, even if you're not really able to engage in like deep therapy that that informal support or somebody to just kind of hold your hands through this process because it can be really terrifying to go through this and most people don't understand it I think mentors people who have gone through their own um kind of benzo withdrawal process, almost like a sponsor, like an alcoholic anonymous is yeah. going to be incredibly helpful because those people are not going to be patronizing you or misdiagnosing you or dismissing you or like not understanding what's going on as somebody who actually has gone through that process of tapering and knows what, you know, has taken those drugs and knows what the dependency is, the tolerance and how it develops. I think that's, and no judgment as well. A lot of people are going to mistake this for addiction. Even mental health professionals or medical professionals who are saying, you know, this person is medication seeking, they just want their drugs and, you know, all of that. Person does not need that when they're going through this process. And so if you can connect with someone who really understands the situation and have that support for you, then that's worth something. It's not something you want to deal with on your own. And even though that is the reality of it, 
most of the time you are on your own. Because family members don't understand a lot of the times, unless you're somebody who has been on psychiatric drugs, and especially with benzos, no one truly understands what people go through. Um, and a lot of people don't experience, some people don't experience a, a dependency and issues around this or withdrawal in their experience. So they have no frame of reference. Yeah, they don't have a, a, a broad framework of understanding of, of the spectrum of experiences a person can have uh, with these, you know, with the struggles that people are having before, during, and after, you know, uh, they are on these medications. You know, it's, it's, it's something that the broad population really just pretends doesn't exist. It's almost like, you know, mental health, like true, truly considering, you know, mental health and what people struggle with, not just the pop marketing of, oh, Amazon takes mental health seriously now. Like, not that crap. The actual being with the people and treating of serious situations and conditions is something that most people just would rather pretend doesn't exist. Oh, yeah, it's so uncomfortable. and. Yep. Uh, challenging uh -huh. and it takes a certain level of you know empathy and compassion to sit with people in those lonely places and so it's a similar to like yeah there are certain topics and things that people would rather just pretend that they don't exist and this is definitely one of those areas yeah it's like so if if you can find, you know, a person or a support group or just any cohort of people that has been through a similar situation is there to really support you, uh, it, it's invaluable. It, it might be the most important thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is one advice I would give around any type of tapering and or dealing with benzodiazepine dependence and the withdrawals and that whole journey. And it's going to be a journey. And the other thing I would say is that never listen to a prescriber who tells you to come off of benzodiazepines in four weeks. I don't care how long, if you've been on it for longer than two to four weeks, you're going to have to go incredibly slow in the tapering process. So if your physician or psychiatrist says, oh yeah, half the dose for, even if you are on something like a one milligram dose or 0.5, a tiny dose, you're still going to have risk injury if you don't taper properly. So you have to listen to your body when you start to notice symptoms. First of all, I wouldn't do that taper at all. The general guideline recommendation for tapering in terms of the, from um, the deep prescribing guidelines is five to 10% of the medications every 30 days. Sometimes people would have to go on lower doses, uh, even less than 5%, depending on their history and other complications and other considerations. And most of the time you're gonna end up when you get to the lower doses to switch to a liquid formulation to be able to do a micro taper of really tiny, tiny doses. And the tapering process is gonna get harder on the lower doses of the medication. You might do okay on the higher doses, but when the lower doses come up, you're gonna have a lot of symptoms. So benzodiazepine uh, tapering might take several months, if not several years to come off of. And that whole process is going to be a really a harrowing journey. And so never accept a prescriber that if you've been on the, the drug for a long time to, to tell you, and a lot of people, like I said, they're actually cold turkeyed and cut off from prescribers and then they can't find a prescriber to go through, you know, to help them ta uh, taper. And so people actually end up buying um, the drug off the streets and online and they really don't know what what's in them, or if they're getting proper dose of the medication, it's actually really incredibly terrifying. So what you need to do is you have to go very slowly and you have to educate yourself in this process and get as much support as possible to do this without essentially causing yourself more harm or injury. 
and don't take the, the guide through the process of uh, tapering is your body and your body's feedback, not the prescriber. It shouldn't be the prescriber. I know this is a challenging situation that you're going to find yourself in, but you have to listen to your body and adjust accordingly in terms of your tapering plan and how you go about tapering. So yeah, those are kind of the, the few um, kind of advice I would give if you are in that situation of having be become dependent and now experiencing tolerance and withdrawal. And it does, like I said, there are many people, many stories that are um, people tapering off benzos successfully. Yes, very difficult, challenging uh, road and journey, but it can be done and you can move forward and you can continue to nurture your body and brain and recover slowly and move forward with your life and gain your life back. And I think that's what happens to people a lot of times with benzodiazepine addiction is people really lose tremendous amount of things in their lives, livelihood, businesses, marriage, uh, connection with children. It can really just decimate a person. And so it's going to be a process to go through and kind of gain, claim your power and your life back. So I'm sorry that if you're going through that process right now and, um, but yeah, surround yourself with as much support as possible. Nope. I, uh, I completely agree. So, um, just to end this then, if you have any questions, comments, um, if you've been prescribed benzodiazepines and you're going through, you know, experiencing withdrawals, or even if you're someone who has gone through this process and has successfully recovered and tapered off, please share your comments below because I think those stories are going to give other people hope. And uh, if you enjoyed this content, please um, pass it forward to other people, share it. And um, so that we can raise more awareness about these drugs, because they are still being prescribed, prescribed every day to children and adults. And so I just wanted to take this time today to have that discussion and conversation. So thank you so much. And um, we will see you on the next episode. Thank you for watching this. Bye for now.